this morning. Lord, amidst all of the struggles, the trials, and the pain, it's a happy day, Lord. And we rejoice, Lord, because you are God of gods, King of kings, Lord. Thank you for this time that we can gather together and worship in this beautiful place, Lord, that you have so graciously blessed us with, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Oh, happy day. You can be seated by the way. Thank you, Capono. What do you want? <laughs> oh, that song. Oh, happy day. I could sing that all day, every day. And I hope it's stuck in your head all day, today. Man, give me a moment. I'm serious. Thank you, Lord. Well, good morning and welcome. Those of you online, we're glad you're joining with us. This is our Prophecy Update. Second service, which will be live streamed at 11.15 a.m., that's Hawaii time, is the sermon. And today, oh, happy day. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not really, actually. That might be all through the day. So you better get used to it now, oh, happy day. But today we begin our study in the book of Revelation. And we're just going to take the first three verses. And what we're going to do is start out with an explanation of how in no uncertain terms it's abundantly clear that Jesus is coming quickly. So really looking forward to beginning in the book of Revelation today. For those of you that were with us on Thursday night, we began our verse by verse study through the book of Daniel, often referred to as the Old Testament book of Revelation. So we've got perfect bookends on our Thursday night study and our second service sermon. So for those of you that are online, by way of YouTube or Facebook, we would encourage you to go directly to jdfrog.org, because there you'll find the uncensored and uninterrupted entirety of today's update. All right. What I want to do is address this often used saying and question known as do they know something we don't? The presupposition is that they represents those in the know, and we represent those who are not in the know. In the context with which I wish to address this, they are the demon-possessed conspirators, as I prefer to refer to them as. And by extension, they are privy to that which we as common folk are not, or so they think. This is why they resort to drastic measures and employ great deception to ensure we're not, or so they hope. Thankfully, a few do know, which makes this paradoxical in the sense that we, as Christians, should be the ones in the know, and know what they do not know, but need to know. Is it too early for this? <laughs> Let me explain. As born again Christians, we know God. Who knows all? <laughs> and inspired writers 
by the Holy Spirit to record what we need to know in the pages of Scripture. We should be the ones in the know. It's called Bible prophecy. I'm not trying to be snarky. For one thing, I don't have to try. It comes very easily. Thank you very much. But it's called Bible prophecy. What's Bible prophecy? It's history in advance. <laughs> Bible prophecy is God wanting us to know what's going to happen before it happens. Then, when we're the ones in the know concerning what's really going to happen, it's incumbent upon us to let others know what, and more importantly, who we know. His name is Jesus. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 13, 19. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am the great I am. John 14, 29 says the same thing in a little different way. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Luke 21, 28, familiar to many. And by the way, we're going to come back to this verse, Jesus speaking, and says, now, when these things, key word, begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads. Why? Because your redemption draws nigh. That's why. Now, let's take what in most cases is the wrong question of, do they know something we don't, for which there is no right answer, and re-ask it as the right question, so as to have the right answer. In other words, it's not, do they know something we don't? Rather, it's, should we know something they don't? Answer, yes. Those of us who know the Word of God and the God of the Word should know what's going to happen before it happens. Why? Because Jesus told us that He was going to tell us what's going to happen before it happens. So when it begins to happen, we will believe and believers will look up knowing that because He told us what was going to happen, and now we're seeing it begin to happen, He's coming. It's not what's coming, it's who's coming. Enter the upcoming event that is going to happen. And I'm hoping that after today, we'll all know the prophetic significance of it happening. What I'm speaking of is the much talked about phenomenon dubbed the Great American Eclipse of 2024 which will happen on Monday, April 8th. That's in two weeks and one day from today. Oh, happy day. Sorry, not really. And it seems that there are those who may know something that most don't. I'll start with what we do know. And please know that the significance of this cannot be dismissed under the banner of coincidence at best, or conspiracy at worst. And this because the anomaly of this is inexplicably and statistically so odd that it has to be God. You know what I'm talking about? You had a situation in your life that is just so complex, so crazy, so odd, you know it's God. This has to be God. There's no other explanation for this. Well, such is the case with this. By virtue of the virtual impossibilities of the eclipse's path across the continental U.S. 
Add to this the inexplicable anomaly and statistical improbability of the path across the U.S. of the previous eclipse some seven years prior in 2017. Actually, if you want to get technical, some are suggesting that it was six years, six months, and six days or so prior. Okay, well, that was, I'll take it. Pictured here is a graphic from a local news station in Kentucky showing both eclipses forming the shape of, at first glance, an X. Additionally, it's a tav. What's a tav? The tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet and or depending on your viewpoint and the angle in which you look at this, it's also in the shape of a Christian cross and or all of the above. And even more interesting is this graphic of both the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav. All three form together vis-a-vis -vis the August 21st, 2017 eclipse, the not so well known October 14th, 2023 eclipse, and this upcoming April 8th, 2024 eclipse. It's believed that this is one of many signs in the sun, moon, and stars that Jesus, who is the Alpha Aleph and Omega Tav, spoke of in Luke 21. Let's get the context in which Jesus said in verse 28 of Luke 21, that when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads. Why? Because your redemption draws nigh. What are these things that we are to look for as to when they begin to come to pass? Verse 25, these are the things. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, tsunami, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the power of the heavens will be shaken. Then, speaking of the second coming, they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. These signs in the sun, moon, and stars comports with the first book of the Bible in Genesis, the first chapter, beginning in verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. Stop. I'm going to create the sun, the moon, the stars, the sun for the day, the moon for the night, and they're going to be for signs and seasons. Signs and seasons. You know what that word seasons is in the original language of the Hebrew Old Testament? It's the word moadim. Thank you very much. I know that was very helpful. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor. That's deeply profound. Oh, happy day for me today. What is moadim? It's the plural for moad. What's moad? It's the word in the Hebrew, the same word in my native tongue of Arabic, moad, that 
carries with it the idea of an appointed time, an appointment that points to a time yet future that that sign points to. Here's an illustration. I'm reluctant to say that I came up with it, because then it's not as good as when I don't come up with these illustrations. You go into town, Honolulu, you see a sign, Kaneohe, 14 miles. That sign points you to your final destination. Now the sign has served its purpose in getting you to the final destination. It has fulfilled, fulfilled its purpose as a sign pointing to this appointed time. So if I say to you in Arabic, I will, boy, the translators, bless your hearts. I'm, you have huge treasures in heaven. They try to do the transcripts of these in Arabic. If I say to you in Arabic, Ana andi mu'ad ma'akum. I have just said to you in Arabic, I have an appointment with you. Ana, I, andi, have mu'ad, appointment with you, ma'akum. It's an appointment that points to an appointed time. Now why am I going so in depth into this? Because in the creation, God created the sun and the moon and the stars to be signs that would point to that which will be ultimately fulfilled by Jesus Christ who fulfills them at the appointed time. That sign is still there. It served its purpose. What was its purpose? To point me to my final destination. Well, all of these signs, seasons, Mo'adim, Mo'ad, festivals, which we're going to talk about in a minute, Leviticus 23, the feasts of the Lord, these are Mo'ads. I'm sorry I'm yelling. <laughs> this is very exciting to me, because we are being told in Genesis 1 that God created the sun, the moon, the stars to be signs and mo'adim, signs that would point to, be a sign for. And they would be for days and years, and let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, sun, moon, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. I, I like that. It's kind of like, oh yeah, don't forget the stars. <laughs> he made the sun and the moon, and oh yeah, He made the stars also. That's a whole other topic for another time, by the way. I'm not talking astrology. That's occultic and satanic. I'm talking astronomy. <laughs> God flung those stars, named those stars, too numerous to count. You can't count them. God can. He even knows them by name. He created them. And there are as many stars in the sky as there are sands on the seashore. And we're not just talking Kailua Beach alone. Just to put it into perspective, if you can just wrap your mind around that. Okay. So if the sun and moon were created as signs and seasons pointing to an appointed time, then wouldn't it stand to reason that any solar or lunar eclipse must serve as said sign and appointed time? This is not lost on Israel 365 News, who published an article bearing the title, I love it when they do this, Solar Eclipse of Biblical Proportions Will Transverse the Continental United States. In this article, they all but suggest the odds of the path of both eclipses to be incalculable, citing the statistical improbability of the number of cities, and more importantly, the names of the cities, the eclipses, and I'm choosing this word, will 
Passover. Passover. You like that? I do. Passover. The 2017 eclipse, also known as the seven Salem eclipse, Salem, peace in Arabic, Shalom, peace in Hebrew, Jaru Salem, Yaru Shalom, because in Hebrew they don't pronounce the J, in Arabic we do. So we want the J in there, so it's Jerusalem. But in Hebrew it's Yaru Shalom. It used to actually be named Salem. You can find that in the Old Testament accounts. Salem simply means Shalom, peace, Salem. And it's not a cigarette. <laughs> Just to throw that in, because make sure you're still with me. So the seven Salem eclipse passed over, Passover, seven, the number of completion U.S. locations named Salem, 2017. Salem, Oregon, Salem, Idaho, Salem, Wyoming, Salem, Nebraska, Salem, Missouri, Salem, Kentucky, and Salem, South Carolina. I never knew there were so many Salems in the United States. Okay. What about this upcoming eclipse? Well, this eclipse will pass over seven, the number of completion cities named, wait for it, Nineveh. Nineveh, Texas, Nineveh, Missouri, Nineveh, Indiana, Nineveh, Ohio, Nineveh, Pennsylvania, Nineveh, Virginia, and Nineveh, New York. One has even suggested that its path going further north enters into Nova Scotia, where there is an eighth Nineveh that it will pass over, eight the number of new beginnings. Now, <laughs> on its face, this may seem nebulous and inconsequential, absent Matthew 12, beginning in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, speaking of Jesus, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What? For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he says this, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here, speaking of himself. When Jesus says, indeed, a greater than Jonah is here, he's referring to what's known as typology the type. Jonah is a type and a prophetic sign, Moad, pointing to the appointed time when Jesus would fulfill it. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days, so too would the Savior of the world be in the belly of the earth for three days before He was resurrected from the dead on the third day. And this is the only sign you're going to get. I mean, you'll forgive my, the way I see the humor in this, but here they are. Can you imagine? I would have loved to have been a fly on a camel to hear this. Teacher, <laughs> with all due respect, we need a sign to validate, authenticate your credentials as the Savior of the world and the Son of God and God the Son. Jesus' response, okay, well, let's, let's get started. No. <laughs> you, you adulterous, wicked generation, you seek after a sign. 
the fulfillment of that sign is standing right in front of you. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a sign. You want a sign? <laughs> this is, I know this is bad, but again, I, you'll forgive the way I, I know they have clinical terms for people who see things this way, but you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Jonah. Boy, they didn't want to hear that because they knew Jonah. I mean, after all, these were the scribes that transcribed the Scriptures meticulously, carefully, and the Pharisees, they were the police. And so when he says, you want a son, I'll give you this. You can't handle this. No, that's a different. <laughs> I'll give you a sign. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. You know what's not so widely known about Jonah? When he began, keyword, to enter Nineveh, it was believed to be on June 15, 763 BC. And it was recorded that there was a solar eclipse. And not only was there a solar eclipse, but so too was there also a great earthquake, as recorded in the book of Amos during the reign of Jeroboam. Fast forward to Christ's crucifixion, recorded in Matthew 27, verse 45, and you'll find that there was a solar eclipse for three hours, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which was the exact time that Christ was crucified. And when you get to verse 51 of Matthew 27, we find that in addition to a solar eclipse, so too was there a great earthquake at the time Jesus died. So great was this earthquake that it split the massive rocks there outside of Jerusalem. And at the same time, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom into in Jerusalem. Here's a screenshot from Britannica's website citing the original biblical source and what I'll call prophetic timestamps in Scripture, like 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, among others. According to Britannica, there was a solar eclipse known as the Bur Segel eclipse on June 15th of the year 763 BC over the Assyrian capital city of Nineveh. Now, I am keenly aware that this could be seen as a stretch connecting these sources to Old Testament history and not so much New Testament prophecy. However, if the Savior Himself is referring to Jonah and what happened with Nineveh as the Old Testament sign that would be given to the New Testament scribes and Pharisees, then we would all do well to pay attention. Do you agree? Listen to Jonah 3 verses 4 through 9. Notice the detail. And Jonah began key word, began to enter into the city, a day's journey. And he cried, cried out, not wept, and said, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. By the way, can I clear something up and get something off my chest here? He never preached repentance. He didn't want them to repent. How do we know that? Because when they did repent, he pouted. He was a little upset with God. Not a little, a lot upset with God. He, he, there's no gospel message here. There's no good news. It's nothing like, hey, you need to repent. You need, you need to get saved, because in 40 days God is going to judge you and destroy you. There's not, none of that. It's more like this. And again, you'll forgive me for seeing it this way and saying it this way, but it was more like, I can't wait, because in 40 days you guys are toast. No, that's what he said. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And he didn't say anything else after that. That's a very short invitation, which isn't really an invitation. 
or gospel presentation. There's no gospel presentation. It's just a declaration. In 40 days, you guys are going to be toast. And I'm going to go up here and sit and get a better view of Nineveh so I can watch it. And for 40 days, I'm going to have to wait a month and 10 days. But man, I'm going to be here and I can't wait and see what happens in 40 days. <laughs> have a nice day. Oh, happy day. <laughs> So what happens? Here's this prophet Jonah that Jesus says, that's the only sign you're going to get. And he proclaims to Nineveh that in 40 days they're going to be destroyed, judged, overthrown. So what do the people do? They believed. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Interesting. If there was a prophecy conference, which I don't want to talk about prophecy conferences. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that like that. But the Lord knows my heart. I don't think Jonah would be invited to be one of the speakers. Yet a whole country came to a saving knowledge of the God of Israel because of a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight word sermon. Um, I don't even know if Jeremiah would be invited. Uh, 40 years, by the way, we're talking about 40 in a second, but not one person. I would have loved to have had a conference. I won't. I, I never will. <laughs> I've never actually had a conference. I've spoken at them. I don't anymore. But if I, if I were to, just for sake of discussion, hypothetically speaking, if I were to have a conference, I would only have two speakers, Jonah and Jeremiah. That's all. Perfect. And, and probably nobody would attend or live stream that particular conference. Where are, you, where are you going? What are you trying to say here? Well, I'll just come out and say it. 40 is the number of judgment. And in 40 days, Nineveh was going to be judged, but they didn't. Why? Because they repented and were saved. I want to just mention this kind of parenthetically. If you could just bear with me. I can explain to you why it is that they did, much to the surprise of one prophet, Jonah. He was, I'll just be uh, gracious here. It's not hard though. He, he was, is this gracious enough, vomited out of the great fish after being in the belly of the great fish for three days on the beaches there on the shores of the city of Nineveh. Now why is that important? Here's why. Uh, the Ninevites served this god, Dagon, that was half man, half fish. No, this, this gets good. So here comes a fish <laughs> You're getting this, right? And out of the fish comes a man that says, in 40 days you're going to be toast. I think God's got their attention, because their God is Dagon. The Philistine God was also the Ninevite God, half man, half fish. Remember when they took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple of Dagon, the Philistines, when they captured the Ark? And then they get, they get up the next morning, go into their temple, and here's their god Dagon on its face before the Ark of the Covenant. All bust up. So what do they do? They glue him back together. You know you got a problem when you've got to put your god back together. And, and then more things happen. It's, listen, it, it 
God's got a sense of humor, okay? So, I mean, they can't get rid of this thing fast enough when more things start happening, because here's their God, half man, half fish, Dagon, and he's on its face, Dagon it, before the Ark of the Covenant. This is not a happy day for them. So now, say with me, you've got a man coming out of a fish, and they serve a God that is half man, half fish. And when he's preaching to them, there's a solar eclipse, where the sun is darkened, and then there's a great earthquake. And this man came out of the fish. I think we better repent. And that explains why. Because absent that explanation from God's Word, you have no explanation for why. And these Ninevites were so evil, which is why Jonah didn't want to go. See, Jonah knew God and knew the nature of God, and God would send him there not to judge them, but to save them. And Jonah knew it, and he didn't want them to get saved. I'm going to leave that one between you and the Holy Spirit, because maybe somebody's coming to your mind right now. It's all yours. You can take it from there. Okay, so what's the deal with 40 days? Okay, so it's the number of judgments. So what? Well, let's fast forward 40 days from April 8th. And we in so doing, come to the season, season of the feast, Moad, of weeks, aka the Feast of Pentecost, which was to be after the day after seven sevens, seven weeks. It's also known as the Feast of Weeks. You got seven weeks, and on the day after the completion of the seven weeks, which is 49 days, on the 50th day, wow, the pastor can count from 49 to 50, five is pent, pentateuch, pentagon, pentagram. On the 50th day, that's the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So it would come 50 days after the feast Moad of first fruits. What's first fruits? A type, a sign, a Moad pointing to the appointed time when Jesus the Christ would be resurrected as the first fruits from the ground. Let's back up. The study of the feast is amongst the most, if not the most, fascinating in all of the Bible. Passover, the Feast of Passover, which by the way, some of you are probably looking at me going, how come you're not announcing anything about next Sunday being Resurrection Sunday? I will. Back off. (laughs) Next Sunday is when the world celebrates, I don't call it by its other pagan name, never will. To us, it's Resurrection Sunday. It's the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Oh, happy day. So it's Passover, which was the crucifixion, the feast of Passover, well known of the seven feasts. The angel of death would pass over the house of Israel in Egypt before the exodus, when they were delivered out of Egypt, if they had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their house, the top, the basin at the bottom, and the left and the right in the shape of a cross. 
if they had the blood of the land that they inspected to be without defect, blemish, spot, wrinkle, for four days, which was the number of days that Jesus was on trial before His crucifixion, found to be without sin, then that lamb was slain, that blood was shed, and placed with a hyssop branch on the doorposts of the house, and the angel of death would pass over, and they would be saved. That's the Feast of Passover. Unleavened bread, that's the burial, the second piece of bread in the middle. The unleavened bread, leaven, a picture of sin, is buried. You have three pieces of bread, all unleavened. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Son is the second in the middle, buried and hidden. Jews to this day have a celebration where the Cakey have to find the hidden, buried bread representing the person of Jesus Christ during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you got Passover, Unleavened Bread, first fruits, all fulfilled in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Fifty days later, after the first fruits, Pentecost. <laughs> now this is where it gets really interesting, and I want to keep moving in the interest of time. But suffice it to say that all of these feasts, of which there are seven, the number of completion, point to the person of Jesus Christ and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So what happens after Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets? <laughs> then the, the Feast of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and then the seventh one, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. All prophetic pictures, all Moads, signs pointing to their ultimate fulfillment when they reach their final destination in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's coming up. In addition to the aforementioned Ninevehs, there are other names of towns and cities which are very interesting. Pictured here is a screenshot from the website greatamericaneclipse.com, which actually has an interactive video of the eclipse path over several states, including Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Illinois, and Tennessee. I did a flyover using their real-time video, and I found four you may find more, but I found four that are of particular interest. The first one is Cairo. The second one is Mount Carmel. And then the third one is a little known town known as Little Egypt, which is in the Carbondale, Illinois area. Now why do I point this out? Because of the prophetic significance of these biblical names, in addition to Salem and Nineveh, and perhaps more importantly, the scriptural accounts and types that are associated with them. Now, in addition to these three biblical names, you'll notice that the eclipse will pass over a town named New Madrid. Hang on to that. We're going to talk about that shortly. It gets even more interesting because pictured here is the Corpus Christi, Texas website invitation to view the April 8th solar eclipse from Corpus Christi, Texas. They even have a countdown clock down to the seconds on their web page. I took a screenshot of this early Wednesday morning. And I know you're probably asking yourself, okay, so what? Well, I'll tell you, so what? You know what the Latin Corpus Christi means in English? Body of Christ. Ah, oh, it's just a coincidence. Don't do that. Speaking of Texas, I'd like to draw your attention to the website eclipse2024.org. There you will find cities with specific coordinates for the best view of the eclipse when it will pass over. And as it turns out, Jonah, Texas is one of those cities. Oh, 
it gets way better. You ready? At the same website, you'll find that this eclipse will pass over and into, don't get ahead of me. You know the center point of all places? Rapture, Indiana. Okay, I just got chicken skin, goosebumps for our brothers and sisters on the mainland. <laughs> look, look at this, look at this graphic. Rapture, Indiana, but look, Williamston, Kentucky. What's in Williamston, Kentucky? That's where the Ark Encounter is located. As many of you know, some have even visited. I am sanctified in my jealousy of you. <laughs> the Ark Encounter is a full-size replica of Noah's Ark. And I know you know how much I love typology, but you've got pre-tribulation rapture all over this. Because Enoch was a type of the church pre-flood, and Noah is a type of Israel that goes into the flood and is saved in the midst of the flood, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who we're going to study on Thursday night in Daniel, were saved in the seven times hotter fiery furnace. But Daniel's not there. Why? He was exalted and taken up pre-furnace. Just like Enoch, who walked with God and poof, was no more, because God took him pre-flood. These are types. These are pictures. And they're replete throughout the Scriptures. Oh, come on, it's just a coincidence. The rapture's right smack in the center of the cross of these eclipses? No way. Way! Way! Okay, this is probably as good of a time as any. For those who take these videos, and edit them, and post them on TikTok, which we're not on. I just want to go on the record and say that I am not saying that the rapture will happen on April 8th. <laughs> Let me try that again. Wait, wait, just bear with me. I am not saying the rapture will happen on April 8th. Now let me help you out. Let me try that again. This is for you. You know who you are. <laughs> and so does God, by the way. I'll, I'll make it easier for you to uh, edit this to say what I'm not saying. The rapture will happen on April 8th. Was that good? Is that a take? Is that a wrap? Should we take another one? No. I feel a little better now, so we can move on. Let's talk about New Madrid. You know that New Madrid is a fault line or a seismic zone. Now, <laughs> Both eclipses share the intersection point and path directly over this new Madrid fault line. Do you see where this is going? Remember solar eclipse, earthquake? An earthquake along this fault line would be unspeakably catastrophic and have the propensity to destroy the continental United States via a cataclysmic earthquake of proportions that have never been seen before. Oh, maybe that's why. You know, there's a saying, I'm going to sanctify it. Blessed you live Hawaii. The locals got that. I don't say lucky you live Hawaii, because luck is Lucifer. And Christians don't <laughs> operate under luck. 
we operate under the blessing of God. Bless you, live Hawaii. Maybe that's why they're all moving to Hawaii. Maybe they know something that others don't. Could it be? Who's they, you ask? Oprah, Zuckerberg, Ellison, et al., and all the billionaires that continue to acquire land here in our beloved Hawaiian Islands. Have you heard about this? According to Yahoo Finance, there's a report now of the extent of the holdings of these billionaires and the numerous other billionaires who may be in the know and know something most don't, which would explain why they're coming here. <laughs> and it's not just that they're buying up land in Hawaii, it's that they're also building underground bunkers under Hawaii. It's evidenced by this Hollywood Reporter publication titled, I love this, L listen to this, it's on the screen. Billionaires, survivalist bunkers go absolutely bonkers with fire emotes and water cannons. Wow, do they know something we don't? Listen to this quick quote from the article. On the heels of Sam Ismael's apocalyptic thriller, Leave the World Behind. We talked about that, by the way, in a prior update. Obama, Leave the World Behind. And, and we're going to see this in Revelation, spoiler alert, second service. <laughs> apocalyptic. It's apocalyptic. You know what apocalypsis in the Greek means in English? Revelation. It's a revealing. So when they use words like apocalyptic thriller, oh, it must be very revealing then. It's been twisted into something that it does not mean. By the way, ah, leave the world behind. I have no problem with that. What I do have a problem with is the, and I haven't watched this, nor will I. I have looked at some uh, material to reference it, but I'll never watch it because of the predictive programming and never underestimate the power of the predictive programming with visual motion picture. Don't think, ah, no, I can go watch a horror movie. Be very careful, because they are very powerful. No, no, but I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Well, you'll, uh, I'm sorry, you're a naive Christian. You need to be more discerning than that. This is all predictive programming for the seven year tribulation, because they know what most Christians should know about leaving the world behind. It's an indictment on us. So apparently, on the heels of this apocalyptic thriller, and December news reports that Mark Zuckerberg is constructing a 5,000 square foot bunker under his ranch on the island of Kauai. The business of fortified shelters is booming. Dare I say that this may very well be just the, again, key word, beginning of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy during the seven year tribulation, as we're told in the book of Revelation. We have a graphic description of these catastrophic, and I mean catastrophic, cosmic events, which seem to be the impetus for those in the know, building rock bunkers in which to hide themselves from what they know is coming. I'll begin reading in chapter 6, verse 12. Listen to this. John, by the Spirit, is writing, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Aha! And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, solar eclipse. And the moon became like blood, blood moon. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. 
that be called a sign. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and the islands of Hawaii were, oh, that's uh, not in your version. Let me back up. Every mountain and island, nice try. You can run, but you can't hide from the wrath of the Lamb. Every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, in the bunkers they built, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Wow. This brings me to the heart of the matter, as it relates to this saying, do they know something we don't? Maybe better said, do they know something we don't know, but should know, and let others know while there's still time to do so? There's an urgency like never before for those of us that are born again of the Spirit of God, to let them know that they don't need to hunker or bunker down, because soon and very soon they can be going up. Born again Christians need not fear and hide from what's coming. Rather, we long and look for who's coming. If you'll kindly allow me to, I want to just share from the heart very openly, very candidly for the remainder of our time together today. I want to share with you what I'll call this heavy, heavenly urgency with which all of us should be constrained and even compelled to get Jesus to people and people to Jesus. But in order to do that, we'll go ahead at this time and end the live stream on YouTube and Facebook. <clears throat> 